WTF is Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency and blockchain guide for dinner parties by Maxim Beatty. If you don't believe me or don't get it, I don't have to convince you. Sorry, Satoshi Nakamoto. Introduction. It was the end of the Queensland summer, mid-March 2013. I'd been visiting my parents at their house in the lush, green, natural oasis of Noosa Heads in southern Queensland, northeastern Australia, taking time out from running my Shanghai-based production company and giving my four-year-old Chinese-born daughter the opportunity to strengthen her English at the local primary school. About a month had passed since our arrival and she was successfully developing a Queensland accent when a childhood friend of mine from Melbourne decided to drop in for the weekend with his family for a long-delayed catch-up. By this stage, I'd been living in Asia for more than a decade. It's always great catching up with old friends, but little did I know the information he was about to impart was going to blow my mind and change the course of my career irreversibly. It started with the now infamous website called Silk Road. I can't remember how we got into the subject, but in conversation, I learned from my friend how the internet was transforming the world beyond all recognition. Apparently, carefree university students who wanted to party in Melbourne were no longer acquiring recreational drugs from the local drug supplier they'd met through word of mouth. Instead, they were buying their recreational amphetamines through a website called Silk Road that had become the eBay of illegal drugs and all things illicit. Now it was possible for drug users to browse customer reviews, avoid face-to-face -face contact with dealers, and arrange for undetectable vacuum-packed packages containing small quantities of prohibited substances to be delivered directly to their door or to the mailbox of the abandoned house down the street. I've always had the belief that as long as people don't harm others, they should be free to do whatever they want with their own bodies, whether that be piercing, not wearing clothes, sexual preferences, drinking alcohol, or using drugs. I've always found that banning certain drugs that don't induce violent behavior, like marijuana, and not banning others that do induce violent behavior, like alcohol, to be particularly hypocritical. The realization that suddenly there was a method for corners of the internet to be completely devoid of paternalistic government regulation was fascinating. However, this was only the beginning of the rabbit hole. What really blew my mind was how the payment system worked. Naturally, given the anti-money laundering AML and Know Your Customer KYC policies of credit card companies and PayPal, Ordinary methods of internet payments were not up to the task for these kinds of illegal transactions. As proved by the blockade of WikiLeaks in 2011 by the US government, credit cards are extremely vulnerable to state control if adequate pressure is applied to the intermediary organizations. However, the administrators and users of Silk Road were able to mask their IP addresses by using onion routing protocols. Ironically, a US government developed anonymizing technology that bounces traffic around the internet through a network of servers to essentially prevent third parties from discovering where the internet traffic originates and terminates. This meant that there was no way for a policing authority to block the website. To circumvent any potential payments processor blockades, the administrator utilized an as yet little known open source payment protocol called Bitcoin. Bitcoin is essentially a digital currency that acts much in the same way as cash in that the buyer and seller don't have to trust or know each other to transact, but unlike cash, it is not necessary for the buyer and seller to meet in person to transact. It was this point that completely changed the world for me. I realized immediately that this technology had the potential to change the world, and this was before I'd even looked at the price. As soon as my friend left, I started researching on the internet and didn't stop for two days. Then I noticed the price action. The first time I looked at the price graphs, I was astounded. The price was around US $60 when I first checked. However, within a few days, it had climbed to US $80. Then, looking back at the historical price graphs, I realized it had climbed from US $10 in mid-2012 and from as little as 
US 5 cents in 2009. With this kind of trajectory, the sky seemed the limit. And as a trained economist and entrepreneur, I had a good idea about how markets work. I had to get my hands on some. Of course, at that time, the market wasn't so well developed, and dodgy, unprofessional outfits abounded. There was some guy selling it in Australia via Google AdWords for a 10% commission, which seemed a bit risky and excessive. Then I found a website in China called BTC China that allowed you to purchase with a Chinese bank card, which I had. I also discovered the infamous Mt. Gox, the least dodgy looking exchange that controlled 80% of the global market at that time and was based in Japan. However, to get the money to Mt. Gox required going through some suspicious Russian based payment processor that just made me uneasy as hell. So I made my first purchase via BTC China, then remembered an old bank account I had that was still open from when I was living in Japan. Bypassing all the untrustworthy third parties, I was able to make an additional purchase on Mt. Gox. I was now a so-called hodler, someone who buys and holds cryptocurrency, and had some skin in the game. Had I made the right decision? Was Bitcoin the future? I now had an incentive to understand what the hell it was that I'd actually bought. Chapter 1. What is money? From my early years as an economics major in university, I always found inflation to be a curious concept. Why did it exist? What was its purpose? How does it tie in with GDP growth? My research into the answers to these questions opened my eyes to a lot of the illusory underpinnings of our economy. As most people understand, governments, as the stewards of the economy, have a monopoly on the creation of inflation. The most obvious reason for this, and the reason that is most widely publicized in movies and popular culture, is to prevent the debasing of the currency by criminals creating counterfeit units. Think of 1930s gangsters with cigars, tommy guns, and printing presses. The less well-known reason is that inflation is a secret tax that raises major revenues for governments. While governments are fighting against the debasement of currency by criminals on the one hand, they fiercely protect their right to debase the currency themselves to provide extra government revenue for their own salaries and power base. Of course, it isn't publicized, and there's no line item in your monthly salary statement showing the amount of value your monthly wage has lost through the increased price of the merchandise you purchase with your wages. Inflation is kept gradual enough to prevent the general populace from noticing how detrimental its effects are to purchasing power. What most people don't realize is that inflation is a new phenomenon. If you read books from the 1700s and the 1800s and compare the prices mentioned for everyday items, you'll notice that prices from the start of the 18th century were very similar to the prices of the mid-19th century. The idea of ever-increasing prices just didn't exist. The major reason for this is because governments backed all currency with tangible assets like gold and silver. In the days of the gold standard that ended in the early 1970s, it was theoretically possible for every dollar bill to be traded at a bank for an amount of gold of exactly the same value. Of course, in the late 20th century, governments realized that people's faith in money had increased so much that it was no longer necessary to back fiat currency with anything. And governments in need of additional revenue started printing money with impunity. As a result, inflation and the secret inflation tax increased tremendously. Note the high inflation rates of the 1970s and 1980s. Then there is the story of growth. Inflation not only increases the prices of goods and services, it increases prices across the economy. Company profits increase, valuations increase, share prices increase, and wages increase. Inflation provides the illusion of progress when economies may in fact be far more static than we realize. Rising nominal wages keep the populace subdued and reduce complaints, even though real wages may in fact be falling. Inflation also pumps up real estate prices, especially in this low interest rate environment, and people start to feel richer even though this effect may in fact be completely illusory. 
people remain under the impression that the economy is moving forward when in fact it's moving backward. So how can this happen? The answer lies in faith. It's even written on the US currency coins and notes, in God we trust. Currency is based on belief. The belief that if someone pays me $1, in the future I can trade that $1 for something else of equal value. However, the inflation scam is undermining that faith. People are starting to notice their eroding wages and the fact that our money is deficient. So is gold the answer? Come to think of it, what even is gold? To understand how important faith is in underpinning the soundness of money, one has to realize that even gold has not always been such a precious commodity. There was a period in ancient times when gold was merely a yellow-colored rock. It wasn't until people became aware of how rare it was and recognized its finite supply that we started to ascribe value to it. It was only once faith in gold was established that it could be confidently used as a store of value and as a unit of account. It doesn't take much imagination to remember a time when gold, like Bitcoin, was in the price discovery phase with buyers and sellers arguing about whether it genuinely had value or not. Many people will say that much of gold's value comes in its utility value for jewellery and electronics production. Alas, this is not the case. In fact, less than 5% of gold's value can be attributed to its utility value. Actually, the idea of one form of money being supplanted by another form of money is not new. It's age-old. Cowrie shells were once a unit of account. These were eventually replaced by gold. Gold gave way as an everyday currency to fiat, government printed currency. Fiat has now been largely replaced by bank accounts and thus the idea of cryptocurrency replacing bank accounts as a sounder unit of account is not far-fetched. How is it sounder? For Bitcoin, the rate of money creation is limited and hard-coded in the program and can only be altered by community consensus. In 2018, only 12.5 bitcoins were created every 10 minutes, and the program dictates that the supply will be halved every four years until 2140. Currently, there are only 17 million bitcoins, and by 2140, there will only be 21 million bitcoins, after which no new bitcoins will ever be created. As long as the demand for Bitcoin continues to increase more than the supply, the price per Bitcoin will continue to appreciate. This contrasts with the gradual drop in value of fiat currencies and is one of the major incentives for Bitcoin users to hold onto the currency. Most cryptocurrencies have a similar supply profile. What is also important to understand is that cryptocurrencies are still a relatively new concept to the world and still undergoing price discovery, hence the massive price volatility. The market is still trying to determine what these currencies are worth, if they are worth anything. Thus, it's difficult to compare them to gold or the dollar, which have built up a lot more trust and confidence by continuing to hold value uninterrupted for hundreds of years, in gold's case, thousands. If Bitcoin were 100 years old instead of just 10 years old, you can guarantee that its value would be considerably more stable. Another important concept to comprehend is money's role as a form of communication. That is, money is a way of communicating to the world that you have completed a certain amount of work of a certain value and that you should be able to receive something in return for that work done. Thus, a $10 note in your possession proves to the economy you have done $10 worth of work that created $10 worth of value for another actor in the economy, who was willing to compensate you $10 for creating that value. This concept is crucial because, at its heart, all that Bitcoin and other blockchain-based cryptocurrencies are is verifiable, trustless methods of communicating and transmitting value. The blockchain is a way of accounting for and recording these messages in perpetuity. Next episode of WTF is Bitcoin, the Cryptocurrency and Blockchain Guide for Dinner Parties, we'll be reading Chapter 2, The Foundation, Encryption and P2P File Sharing, and we'll focus on the fundamental technologies that had to be invented before Bitcoin could become a reality. 
If you enjoyed this episode, don't hesitate to like, comment, subscribe, and share this podcast with anyone you think will enjoy it. It really helps us reach a much larger audience.